Today's scriptures will come from Exodus chapter 38, verse 1, and Leviticus chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. Exodus chapter 38, verse 1, Leviticus chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Now read. Then he made the altar a burnt offering of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide, square and three cubits high. Leviticus chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out, but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And he shall lay out the burnt offering on it, and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offerings on it. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. At this time, our Reverend Andrew Pack will come up and give us the message of continually burning fire of the altar of the burnt offering. Hello, good afternoon. All right, it's so good to see everyone today. Okay, thank you. We are continuing to study about the tabernacle that Moses and the Israelites built in the wilderness. And today's title is Continually Burning Fire of the altar of burnt offering. Okay, so we've learned that the tabernacle is God's expression of his love and his desire to reconcile with mankind, right? Remember, Adam was in the Garden of Eden But because Adam disobeyed, he was kicked out, right? So there was this wall or blockage blocking God and man. And what is that called? That's called sin. In Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, it says that sin is blocking us, separating us from God. So Adam's sin is this big wall that separates us from God so that we don't have communion and fellowship with God. But then as the Israelites now came out of Egypt and when they arrived at Sinai, God called Moses up to Mount Sinai and said, tell the Israelites I want to reconcile. I want to make a covenant with them. I want to be their God and I want them to be my people. And the Israelites were happy, right? And the place where I'm going to meet with you to make this happen is the tabernacle. God says, I'm going to meet with you there. Now think about it like this. Have you ever been or gotten into an argument or a fight with someone that you love? It could be your spouse, your sibling, or best friend whoever it may be, the most important person in your life, you get in an argument with them. You're not talking to each other. And it's it's going on. It's lasting for a long time. How does that make you feel? When when that happens, nothing goes right, right? Everything, Everything in your day is kind of dreary and down, right? Your mood is down. It's depressed. Because that's just hanging there. Your relationship is not good right now, right? And in your mind, you're thinking, oh, I hope that other person comes to reconcile with me first, (laughs) right? Because I want to reconcile, but I don't want to be the first one to do it because your pride and ego won't let you, right? But deep down in your heart, you just want this to end and be reconciled again, right? That's how it was between us and God. And God was the one who came to us first. God said, look, I want to reconcile with you. Even though clearly in this situation it was man who did wrong, God came to us first, right? And the tabernacle is an expression of that. The tabernacle is saying God wants to reconcile. He wants to make up. Let's talk. Come meet with him. Okay? That's what the tabernacle is, right? 
Now today, we're studying about the altar of burnt offering. And the altar of burnt offering is the key element in this reconciliation effort between God and us. So the, the tabernacle looks like this. This is the entrance here. This is the altar of burnt offering right here. This is the laver, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. So you see, as you enter in, the first thing you see is the altar of burnt offering. That's the first step in reconciling between God and us. Okay? So what does the altar of burnt offering do? To put it simply, the altar of burnt offering takes care of sin. Okay? Because as I said, it is sin that's blocking our relationship with God, right? Why don't we take time to read this verse, Isaiah 59, verse 2. Let's look that up and read this together. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. So Isaiah chapter 59, I'm going to read from verse 1. So let's read verses 1 and 2, okay? Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, meaning sins, right? Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. See, it was sin that separated us, us from God, right? So if we take care of the sin, then we can go back to God, and we can reconcile with God, and we can have fellowship with God. And that's why the first thing you see as you go into the tabernacle is the altar of burnt offering, because this is where sin will be taken care of, so that we could proceed onward to meet with God. Okay? So we're going to be learning about the altar of burnt offering. <coughs> As we read today, the altar is a square like this, five cubits this way, five cubits that way, and three cubits high, right? It's made of acacia wood. We learned about this kind of wood, right? This is the only wood that was available in the wilderness. It's not very good for construction, but God used it, right? And it symbolizes the humanity of Christ. It also symbolizes our fallenness, right? And then what, what did God do? He overlaid it with bronze. So, because there's going to be fire in it, right? Wood is going to burn. So he covered everything with bronze, and bronze is very fire resistant. It could resist fires like 1,000 degrees hot. Okay? So he overlaid the whole thing with bronze so that none of the acacia wood is seen. The inside is wood, but none of it is seen because the, everything outside is covered with bronze. And then it's got four horns in it, horn on it. Horn here, horn here, on the corners. Okay, four horns on the corner. This is where the, the priest would put, apply the blood of the offering um, on the horns of the altar. The inside is hollow, it's open. Okay, open on top and bottom. And then God told them to make a, a, like a mesh grating like this. My artistic talents will come out here. <laughs> it's, it looks like this. Okay. And then it's like a mesh grating. It's like the barbecue grill, basically. But it's got a little thing with a ho uh, holder here. So this part would fit right here. It would sit into it. 
That means this grading would be around here, right at the midway point. Okay? Like right there. Right? This drawing is it's perfect ratio, right? <laughs> so it's like a barbecue grill. All right? So what, what is this function? What God wanted to happen was he have the fire under the grill, the source of fire, right? And then put wood on top of the grill here. And then put the offering, the animal, on top of the wood. Okay, that's the order he wanted. Fire under the grill, wood on top of the grill, and then the offering, the animal, on top of the wood. Okay? And then these are for the poles to put into so that they could carry it when they're moving. That's what the altar of burnt offering looked like. So what does this teach us? Okay. First of all, the bronze overlay symbolizes the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be overlaid with bronze because we're like acacia wood, right? We are not fire resistant. If we are thrown into the fires of judgment, that's it for us. But if we put on Jesus Christ, His righteousness will cover us. His righteousness is what protects us. His righteousness is what enables us to pass through the fire of judgment, right? That's why we need to be overlaid with bronze. We all have a flawed nature inside. We're all flawed. We're all sinners. God knows that. But what we need is we need to put on Christ and his righteousness. Let's turn to Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says this. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Right? Right? Paul tells us, God is telling us to put on Christ. It is not our own righteousness. It's an external alien righteousness that we have to put on. Okay? And that's what makes us fire resistant. And then the important part here, as the title suggests, is God commanded that this fire be continually burning. One of the main jobs of the priests was to take care of the fire so that it doesn't go out. It has to be burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, open 365 days a year, right, forever. Kind of like 7-Eleven, always open. (laughs) You guys didn't get that? (laughs) All right, whatever. (laughs) That fire has to be continually burning, right? What does that mean? What does this fire teach us, right? He emphasizes it three times. We read in Leviticus 6, 12, and 13, but also in chapter 6, verse 9, he said once more, command that the priests take care of this fire so that it never goes out. So what does this fire teach us? First of all, this fire represents the power of God's word. The power of God's gospel to consume sin. The fire represents the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to consume sin. This fire, what what does it do? When you put the offering on top of it, it burns it completely. And the smoke goes up to the sky, right? So in Hebrew, the the Hebrew expression for burnt offering is the word olah, which comes from a word which means to rise up. 
And that word is used because of how the smoke of the offering rises up to heaven, right? And the Bible says God will smell the aroma of the offering and he would be appeased, right? That animal that is offered on the fire, what is that? That represents the sin in us, right? Before they offer it, what do you do? The person who brings the offering, they lay their hands on it, right? To signify that your sin is being transferred over to the animal. And then they cut it up and burn it on the altar, right? So that represents our sin. That fire burns up our sin. And that represents the power of the word of God to consume sin in us. As we said, we're all born sinners, right? But the word of Christ has the power to consume that sin and turn us into righteous saints. And that needs to be burning at all times. It can't go out. But right now in the world, that fire is dwindling. It's going out, right? That fire must never be snuffed out. So that is the fire of salvation, right? But secondly, that fire also symbolizes the fire of judgment. The word of God in in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, what does it say? The word of God is a double-edged sword. Right? It's a sharp, double-edged sword. Why does it say it's double-edged? So it's like this. It's sharp on both sides, right? The word of God is a double-edged sword because it is power of salvation for those who believe, but also power of judgment for those who reject the word it's got two sides to it for those of us who accept god's word it's salvation but the people who reject this word that in itself is judgment already they have judged themselves when they reject jesus's gospel so that fire represents the fire of judgment so if we accept this word That word, which is like a sharp sword, what does it do? It separates the sin from us so that the fire consumes only the sin and not us. But if we reject this word, that sin still remains in us, so it will burn and judge both the sin and the sinner. See how scary that is, right? So that fire that's continually burning represents the fire of judgment for those who do not accept the gospel of Christ. Jesus said this. Let's look at Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus said he came to bring fire to this world. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Luke chapter 12, verse 49 says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus came to cast fire on the earth, and he would like to see it get kindled and start to burn and blaze up soon, quickly. But unfortunately, while Jesus was here on earth, he did not see that. It only happened after he died and resurrected and ascended to heaven. And when the Holy Spirit came, that fire was kindled in the hearts of the disciples. And even now, Jesus would like to see this fire kindled in our hearts here at our church too, right? We need to be burning up with this fire. And how does that happen? It happens when the word of God takes effect in our hearts. For example, in Luke chapter 24, verse 32, after Jesus died, the two disciples were running away from Jerusalem, going back to their hometown of Emmaus. And as they were walking on the way, the resurrected Lord Jesus appeared to them. They didn't recognize him, right? So they were walking together, 
And Jesus started to explain the scriptures. And he started to explain how it was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would die and then he would resurrect. And when he opened up the scriptures to them, the, the verse here says that their hearts were burning within them. Their hearts were kindled with the fire of God's word. And what did they do? Immediately at that moment, they turned around and went back to Jerusalem. Why did they run away from Jerusalem? Because they were trying to arrest Jesus' disciples. It's a dangerous place. But once the fire was kindled in their hearts, they didn't care. They wanted to go back. And they did go back, right? That's what Jesus wanted to see. And it only happened after his resurrection. And that's what God desires for us here today. Our hearts need to be burning up with this word so that the sin that is in us will be consumed and we will be filled with the righteousness of Christ. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 3, finally on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them and it says that they were speaking in tongues as of fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit came upon them. So the uh, fire represents the power of the gospel of Christ. And then also, thirdly, fire is a refining and purifying agent. Fire is what? Fire is a refining and purifying agent. What does that mean? Fire has, to, fire has the power to cleanse and purify. So, for example, everything, when, some, when it's touched with uncleanness, the Bible categorizes everything as whether clean or unclean. The, the representative uncleanness is a corpse, dead body. If you touch a dead animal or a dead person, a dead body, you are unclean for seven days. But fire is the only thing that cannot be tainted with uncleanness. Even if a dead body comes in contact with the fire, the fire burns it, the dead body cannot make the fire unclean. The fire has this power to be able to change other things whereas it is not changed. That's powerful, right? And that's why fire is a symbol for God. Because nothing could change this fire. The fire whenever, when anything comes in contact with fire, that thing gets changed. Fire itself does not. That's why it's a refining and purifying agent. It has the power to cleanse of uncleanness while it does not get affected by the uncleanness. There are many verses that talk about fire being this refining agent. I'm just going to write it down for time's sake and read it for you guys. Zechariah 13.9, Malachi 3 verses 2 and 3. Isaiah 48, verse 10, and on and on and on, right? There's also Psalm 12, 6. So let me read some of these verses. Zechariah 13, verse 9 says, And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is my God. See? Fire refines. What is refining? Like gold or silver, when they put it in the fire, it melts it down, takes all the impurities out of it, makes it pure. So it refines and purifies. Just as gold or silver is refined in fire, God says our hearts need to be refined in the fire of his word. In Isaiah 48.10, it says this, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction, right? So for his beloved children, you and I, God disciplines, right? The Bible says he disciplines those whom he loves, like a father disciplines his children, right? 
So he disciplines us by throwing us into the furnace of affliction at times. That's not to punish us, but that's to make us stronger and more pure in our faith. That's what fire does, right? Jesus suffered here on earth so that he could learn to obey God. And it's the same thing for us. In life, we go through these afflictions at times, but that's a refining process so we could come closer to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times, right? God's word is pure and refined, and it is like fire. That word is going to refine us and purify us. So finally then, why did God command that this fire never go out? First of all, this unquenching fire on the altar of burnt offering shows that the path to atonement, path to forgiveness, is always open for sinners. Anybody, if they desire, could come to Christ, accept him, and repent, they could have their sins forgiven. That path is open at all times. That's what it's saying. And then secondly, it means God desires for his word to be transmitted from generation to generation. It cannot be stopped. It has to go on. Okay? So we've accepted God's word. Now it has to pass on to the next generation and the next after that and continue on until Christ returns. That fire must never go out. That's our duty because we as Christians, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, we're all royal priesthood. So we're, all believers are priests, not just pastors. Every one of us are priests now. And what was the main duty of the priest? One of the main duties is that they keep this fire going at all times. Every morning they put more wood into it so that it won't burn out. Even when they were transporting the altar, they put the fire in a censer separately, carried it so that it won't burn out. For 40 years in the wilderness, throughout their stay in Canaan, for 486 years, the tabernacle was erected For that whole 486, almost 500 years, that fire never went out. It was passed on from generation to the next generation of priests so that it would never go out. And that's what we need to do here today. The world is trying to snuff out the fire of God's word. The number of Christians are dwindling ever so right now, right? Europe, America, everywhere. It's not growing. We're stagnant or going down. So the responsibility is ours right here. We have to keep this fire going. First, it has to be kindled in our hearts. And then secondly, we have to pass on this fire. Jesus' desire was that this fire just spread like wildfire, right? But right now, the world is not letting that happen. So we need to just really try harder and make sure that this fire never goes out. So in conclusion, the altar of burnt offering is our first step towards reconciliation with God. And what it teaches us ultimately is that in order for us to go to God, our pride, our ego, our thoughts have all need to be consumed by God's fire. We need to die in order to live. Ourself, we have to be consumed by God's fire. We need to be burned up, nothing left. So with the burnt offering, what happens to the animal? You know what is the only thing that is left unburned in the burnt offering? What's the only thing? Hmm? No, everything is burned except the skin. <laughs> they skin the animal, right? And they give it to the priests. 
Everything else, the entrails, the inside, everything is burnt. That's what needs to happen to us. Only the skin is left. <laughs> everything inside needs to be burned with God's fire. You look like Andrew, but you're not Andrew anymore. You're God's word. Jesus Christ is living in you, right? So let's turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, 20. Let's all read this together, okay? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Please find it in your Bible, and we'll all read together, okay? One voice, ready? Begin. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen. See? This is what happens after you pass through the altar of burnt offering. The skin is left, you look the same on the outside, but inside is completely gone, completely changed. It it is Christ that is living in you. That's what needs to happen. And if we enable God to do this, if we entrust ourselves into his hands, this can happen and this will happen. So I pray that all of us will become a living sacrifice whom God will take and change us, transform us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us about the altar of burnt offering and the power of your word to consume sin in us so that we may be a completely changed human being. Father God, we desire this to happen within us. Even though we are weak in the flesh, we know that you are able to do this for us. Please take our lives in your hands and transform us so that we may be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we may be able to confess with Paul, saying, it is no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. Lord, I pray that even though outwardly we may look the same, help us to become a new person in Christ, who will be a true living sacrifice that is pleasing in your sight. We thank you so much for this grace, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.